Welcome to Ask a Therapist, a show where qualified therapists stop by to answer all your questions. Welcome to episode four of Ask a Therapist. We're still in season one, which means the therapist answering all your questions is Daisy, who is the founder of ConvoCare. I'll tell you more about her in a bit, but this is a show where you can get all your questions answered by a therapist and a counselor. We're trying to do our best to help you on your healing journey. So how can you get your questions to us? In the show notes, there's a question form. Drop it there. Keep listening for your answer. Simple as that. Now, in this episode, we'll hear answers to questions dealing with sibling rivalry. And I'll be your host, Adele Onyango. As I said earlier in this first season, Daisy, who's the founder of ConvoCare, will be answering all your questions. She started ConvoCare during COVID where it was very clear there was a need for physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual support, right? Please, may we never have another pandemic. Because <laughs> that was a very hectic time. Now, when you reach out to Daisy and her team at ConvoCare, what you go through is first a consultation just to determine if the therapists will be a good fit for you, you know? And at this consultation, you can ask them any and all questions. And they have multiple different therapies they offer from group therapy to couple therapy to individual therapy to online therapy. For those of you who are not in Kenya or Nairobi, you still have access to Daisy and her team. What's also really different is that once you're at the end of your therapy cycle, they don't just like leave you to your own devices. They do have mentorship where different therapists after termination will still reach out to see that you're coping well. So you've kind of gotten a companion for the rest of your life. Now to book a one-on-one -on -one therapy session, just check out the show notes. We have put there the ConvoCare email address for our diaspora in the community and there's also their phone number in the show notes so please go ahead today and make your booking i truly believe in you i know it can be a bit daunting to start therapy but trust me when i say i think a huge reason why i'm here and able to do what it is that i'm doing have been able to navigate all the trauma I have experienced in life is because of therapy, <laughs> like legit. I know it's not for everyone, but it definitely was for me. And now let's get right into answering all your questions. Welcome back, Daisy. And we've got tons of questions for you in this episode from our community. And the first one is, mm -hmm. Does how you relate to your parents mm -hmm. really affect your intimate relationships? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Parents, <laughs> <laughs> once again, uh -huh, the primary relationship that we have is that that we have from with our parents. What does it do? Number one, it's a wrong model uh -huh, to what we view relationships mm -hmm. uh -huh, like. Uh -huh. Number two, also, it's the reason we, at, um, we, we attach um, it's, it's, it's the cause of how we attach in relationships. So, um, how you relate to your parents does matter. Um, if you constantly saw and secure attachments, even in your childhood, it is possible that they affect how you relate to your partners. Also, um, if you experienced abuse or trauma, it is possible that you can develop trust issues that can be, um, can affect your romantic relationships. Yeah. And so it's interesting with the abuse angle because you mm -hmm. see mm -hmm. situations where um, if someone mm -hmm. witnessed their parents being physically abusive to the other parent, yeah. mm -hmm. when they're older and they get into a relationship, mm -hmm. they are in a relationship where someone mm -hmm. is being abuse abusive, physically mm -hmm. abusive to them. Like, mm -hmm. And this is some, it's like tangible abuse almost, mm -hmm. you know? So why does this happen? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so trauma is familiar. Uh, it is possible that you could try to reenact trauma by looking for it. Mm -hmm. So because of uh, what you saw, you find yourself actually looking for it. It is subconscious, mm -hmm. fully subconscious. It is important that you bring it to the, to the conscious, but you find yourself subconsciously looking for partners who are similar to what you saw. 
Uh, also, there is a um, a chance that you could have a trauma bond where this other part partner also experienced the same. Uh -huh. And now coming together, it brings out now this abusive relationship. So yeah. trauma can be mm -hmm. familiar even mm -hmm. when it's disruptive mm -hmm. and like harming you like yes. even though you're feeling pain it's yes. familiar still. yes 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 because remember when you're you're in trauma for over time for a long time mm -hmm. your your brain could think of it as normal especially a child's brain mm -hmm. they could think that that is normal mm -hmm. and so they they could have as an adult be attracted to or find themselves looking for similar scenarios oh my goodness yeah. okay yeah. How do I navigate relationships with my siblings mm -hmm. when our relationships are drenched mm -hmm. in sibling rivalry? Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> heavy. <laughs> heavy, yeah. heavy. I'm going to share a bit about um, um, the, f the first child, second middle child and the last child mm -hmm. and their, their um, personalities because we, come, we develop personalities depending on our order of birth. Uh -huh. So the first child is more authoritative. Uh -huh. They they want things done their way. Uh -huh. So they come off as dictators. Mm -hmm. Usually make good leaders. <laughs> <laughs> make really good leaders. Uh -huh. um, at some point in their family, they had so much attention because they are the only child. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So this leads us to the second child. Uh -huh. The second child or the middle child of the family usually is the mediator. Mm -hmm. They 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 are looking for to mediate the family because of their order of birth. Mm -hmm. So they are the, they're also the emotional child of the family. Mm -hmm. So you find themselves looking out for fa how the family is doing and you can gauge the how healthy the family is by looking at the emotions of the middle mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the last child, this one is the last born. Uh, they are usually very, um, they, they know what they want. So they find it easier to make friends. Uh -huh. Everybody likes them and therefore everybody tries to to help them because of the family. Um, they came in last. So everybody was more stable. They are supported more. And so for the, for the youngest child, you'd find that sometimes they... Actually, sometimes they do feel left out because everyone tries to tell them what to do. Mm. Now, um, I've brought this so that you realize that personalities stem from our order of birth. And even with sibling riv rivalry, it is possible that um, the order of birth could be something that contributes to it. So, for example, a conflict between the middle child and the old, old eldest would be that the, the eldest wants things done their way, mm -hmm. while the middle child is more emotional, so she's trying to get the feelings of everybody. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So um, to resolve this, you need to understand what roles each one of these people are playing in the conflict. Mm. Communication also is very important because I've said again, communication is most importantly for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The other person benefits, but it's important that you communicate. Mm. Yeah, so um, it's resolving any sibling rivalry involves you noticing the role that they play, communicating your needs. If it's impossible to resolve it within yourselves, seek help, support from an older person or a neutral person. And then if it is impossible for you to resolve, try and create good boundaries, very healthy, and um, try and make and make communicate them so that they can be respected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, um, in terms of the order, so like, mm -hmm. if we are five in the family, so the fourth born takes which, mm -hmm. which personality? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So, um, it depends. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they they are they become the middle child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Most times, that is the middle child because yeah. the last child comes last. Yeah. So it's the first, and then the middle children, uh, and, and then, then the last. last. Yeah. Ah, okay, yeah. got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, mm -hmm. what role do parents play, or mm -hmm. could? parents possibly play mm -hmm. in fueling sibling mm -hmm. rivalry mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. wow wow <laughs> okay so parents do actually play um a big role because depending on uh, whatever is happening between the siblings a parent should be able to enable them to come together and talk and resolve things however in dysfunctional families you'd find that um the the abusive parent uses tactics like triangulation where the triangulation is um, is having different. So, for example, um, I feel bad, 
and I call I call this first sibling, telling them about something. I call the next sibling about um, a different thing. Mm -hmm. So they triangulate. Uh -huh. And, and in, dis in dysfunctional families, there's also the scapegoat of the family who usually receives much of the heat. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It's like the one who is pointed out. So a, a, a parent could actually fuel the dispute in the family through these tactics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, and so do you have to involve the parents when you're trying to resolve sibling rivalry or should you mm -hmm. just keep it mm -hmm. between the siblings? Mm -hmm. it, it, it depends. Mm -hmm. us. If the conflict does involve both parties, then you need to involve the, the parent. But if it doesn't, then the siblings can just resolve them. Mm -hmm. There's the dispute on their own. All right. Mm -hmm. um, and the last question, mm -hmm. how do I tell my demanding mom that as much as I am strong, mm -hmm. I need a break. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I feel like you should write mm -hmm. like my demanding African mom. mom. <laughs> the dynamic is cha changes a bit there. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, okay. The most important um, thing about communication when you're trying to communicate is to to communicate in a way that the other party will understand this is about your feelings. So, for example, when you do this, I feel disrespected. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So it communicates your feelings. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That way the other person cannot get defensive because your feelings are about you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're your feelings. Mm -hmm. So trying to communicate to your mom in that way by especially pointing out your feelings about the situation. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Also... Um, making making them aware as it happens so maybe you your form of communication is that you wait uh -huh, after the conflict has has come <laughs> so trying to make sure that you communicate as it happens when mm -hmm. mom when you always do this this is how i feel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then putting up boundaries boundaries are very important it is easy to break a boundary especially if it has not been communicated mm -hmm. so communicating your boundaries would perhaps help your mom know how to deal with you mm -hmm. yeah i hope this episode gave you insights that can help you on your healing journey remember to send in your questions via the question form and share this podcast with all of your friends and your enemies and remember if you enjoyed the episode please give us a five star rating that's all for this episode if you have a question to ask a therapist please drop it in our question form a link to it is in the show notes catch you next week for the next episode of ask a therapist <laughs>